Thank you, Sister Blair. Thank you very much. Take your Bibles, if you would. Turn to the book of Acts, chapter number 2. Acts, chapter number 2. The title of the message this morning is, New Year, Fresh Burden. New Year, Fresh Burden. Give you some folks to pray for while you're finding your place. Need to be praying for the family of Casey Moore. This is Brother Gaston's niece. Uh, passed away on Friday, only 21 years of age, don't know the details, but uh, tragedy, be praying for her. Keep praying for Brother Danny's brother, uh, Jimmy Collier. They went in on Thursday, I believe it was. They've given him the chemotherapy, gave him the radiation, and thought maybe they could go in and remove some of the cancer from his throat. When they got in there, it was just so spread that they just basically sewed the throat back up, and not much they can do for him, so be praying for that. The Lord will let me, I'm going to preach a message tonight, don't know what the title of it will be yet, but uh, the Lord gave me uh, some verses, and uh, the title will be along the lines of how to endure a tough 2017. Uh, that's not going to be the title, but that's probably along the lines of what we'll be preaching on this evening. This morning, however, New Year, Fresh Burden. Look at two verses with me, if you would please, verses 40 and 41. Acts 2 verse 40 says, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and of prayers. I made the statement several times as 2016 was winding down, I'll probably make it several more times as we open up the door into 2017 that whatever it is that the church has, we need something more of it because sadly, the church just isn't getting the job done anymore. Now that's a sad statement, but I believe it's a true statement. Whatever it is that the church has got, we need either something more or we need something better. Seems in this day and age, very few folks get saved anymore. It seems in this day and age, many good churches are diminishing in attendance. It seems many churches that were good are actually closing the doors of their church. None of this is God's fault. God gave us everything we would ever need to be a powerful witness for Jesus Christ and to be an effective work for Him in this world. The problem, I think, lies within us, the church. Whatever it is that the church has, we need something more and we need something better. What kind of things, preacher, do you think that the church needs? Well, I think there's several, but just one that I will address this morning. I think that the church needs some more spiritually mature Christians. Now, I'm talking from the pulpit all the way down to the pew. I think we need a better caliber of Christian. I think we need some Christians that are more Christ-like. I think we need some Christians that are more godlike. I think we need some Christians that are mature. I think we need some Christians that are willing to give themselves to Jesus Christ. The text that we're looking at has always been an exciting text. Acts chapters 1 and 2 is the birth of the church. And something supernatural is happening in Acts chapter number 2. The Holy Ghost has come. The church has been birthed, and it grows so rapidly. Now, I'm not talking primarily about numbers in these verses, although 3,000 were saved the first time the preacher got up to preach. That's pretty impressive. But I'm talking about they grew spiritually, almost instantaneously. These people grew into spiritual giants. Now, that's even more amazing when you realize this is Jerusalem. And it's just 50 days since these same people had shouted in the streets of Jerusalem, crucify him, crucify him. But now Peter gets up to preach. 3,000 come forward, not just to trust Jesus, but to follow him in believers' baptism. And almost instantly they go from being lost to being saved. And, and then from being saved to being spiritually minded. 
And then from being spiritually minded to being servants of God. Almost instantly, this pattern is followed. Now, in our day, it might be that we might not move quite that fast. But I think the pattern is still the same. That's how things ought to go. We go from being lost to being saved. We should go then from being saved to being spiritually minded. We should go from being spiritually minded to being servants of God. This morning for a few moments, let's look at a couple of thoughts that come from this text. Number one, what does it take for this kind of growth? Number one, it takes infant Christians ministering to themselves. Infant Christians ministering to themselves. Now that's going to require a little bit of explanation. We do understand that Christians have to grow in Christ Jesus. You can't go from being a lost person to being an instantaneously mature Christian person without some supernatural spiritual growth. Let's face it, you can't teach what you don't know. You can't give what you don't have. And you can't live a life that the Holy Ghost doesn't convict you into living. It all requires spiritual growth. Primarily, there's two parties that are responsible for getting infant Christians to grow. The first party are the more mature Christians. The more mature Christians do their best to influence the infant Christians to grow. Well, we do that through several means. We do that through preaching. We do that through teaching. And we do that through modeling the Christian life. That's a large part of what the mature believer is supposed to do, to influence the infant Christian to become a more mature Christian. But there's a second party who has perhaps an even greater responsibility in causing infant Christians to mature. And that is the infant Christians. In order for an infant Christian to grow, the infant Christian has to determine that he or she wants to grow. For example, uh, I'm, I'm the mature Christian now. I hate to acknowledge that, but I'm the more mature Christian. Uh, I can stand up here and I can preach some very eloquent messages. I can teach some great Sunday school lessons. Not that I do, I could. But I could do the, I could model the Christian life. But if you're not here to see them, it really doesn't have any effect on your life at all, does it? And that's one of the strange things. You can be a mature believer and be in the community and in the church and doing your job, but unless the Christians who need to hear, who need to see, who need to grow are there to participate and to receive those things, it really all balances out to nothing at all. You know who's got the greatest responsibility for an infant Christian growing? Who bears the greatest responsibility is that infant Christian. If that infant Christian will not reprioritize his life, will not come to the place where his priorities are set aside and God's priorities become number one in his life, it does not matter what else others in the church, others in the community may do, that infant Christian will remain an infant Christian forever. I'm telling you, the church needs something. It needs something more. It needs something better. It needs a better class of Christians. And I'm not just picking on the pews. I'm telling you, we need a better class behind the pulpit too. Uh, about the only thing that encourages me about politicians is they make us preachers look good. Uh, there, there's a brand of preacher out in the world today, and I, especially American preachers. We just don't look so good. We need some folks behind the pulpit that's got some spiritual growth, that's got some spiritual leadership, that's got the Holy Ghost of God upon them. We need it from the pulpit down to the pew. Now, this text actually tells us four things that these infant Christians did to help themselves mature in Jesus Christ. If you would look down in verse number 42. It says in verse 42, And they continued steadfastly. That means regularly, permanently. They continued steadfastly in what? In the apostles' doctrine. In the apostles' fellowship. In the breaking of bread 
and end prayers. Four things that he lists. Number one, they stayed steadfast in the doctrine. What does that mean? It means they got into the book and they stayed in the book. Now, the actual context here is they stayed under the teaching of the apostles. It was the apostles' doctrine. God does give us older folks in the Lord. And the reason he gives us older folks in the Lord is because somebody needs to have some experience in the Word of God so that they can teach and preach the Word of God. As a matter of fact, one of the things that the Bible actually commands is don't let a novice behind the pulpit for several reasons. One, he doesn't know what he's doing. Second reason that the Bible actually gives because he'll swell up in pride and the devil will be able to get into his life and into his heart. A problem that many churches have is as soon as somebody gets saved, they want to teach them or put them in a Sunday school class or they want to put them behind a pulpit or get them in the ministry. Friend, that's just not the way it works. We need some folks behind the pulpit that know how to handle the Word of God. Granted, everybody's got to start someplace, but to take on the responsibility of pastoring and leading a church belongs to someone who's got some experience in the Word of God. But these people... They continued steadfast, listening to, being preached the Word of God, themselves studying the Word of God. You will never grow in Jesus Christ if you don't bury yourself in that book. Amen. Even if you like to hear preachers preach, and I like to listen to preachers preach. Sometimes I'll be working up here at the church, and I'll turn on and listen to preachers preach. I like to listen to preachers preach, but my friend, nothing is a substitute for thus saith the Lord you got to abide in the Word of God. Not only does he describe in that verse, they abode steadfastly in the doctrine, but they abode steadfastly in the fellowship. That's just another way of saying they abode steadfastly in the church. They were consistent to be with the other believers of the church. Bible warns us the closer to the end of time, the end of the church age we become, the more people will think less of worshiping together in the church of God. That's a fulfillment that we're seeing in this day and age. We're seeing good churches literally diminish in attendance to the place where they're joining bad churches and shutting their doors on Sunday night and Wednesday night. Folks, uh, that won't ever happen, Lord willing. It won't happen while I'm the pastor of this church. But I understand why it happens. When a preacher spends several hours perhaps studying and preparing a message, and then he looks out over his congregation and there's three folks there. Well, he kind of gets the idea nobody really wants to hear the Word of God. By God's grace, I pray that I never become one that is led by the church that way. I want to be one that leads the church in the way that we're supposed to go. But it's important that we understand the church isn't just for doctrine. It's also for good fellowship. You get to come to God's house. You get to hear the word of God. And by good, God's good grace, you get to see somebody demonstrate what it is to live the word of God. And friend, I got news for you. Once a week just must not be good enough because God teaches us that we ought to study together and we ought to fellowship together almost on a daily basis. He's describing what it takes to grow up. Number one, abide in the doctrine. Number two, abide in the fellowship. Number three, he, he, he mentions they partook of the Lord's Supper. It says, and the breaking of bread. It's also interesting. By and large, Christians don't like to participate in the Lord's Supper. What is the Lord's Supper? That's when we stop and remember and appreciate what Jesus Christ did for us. That's all the Lord's Supper is. It's us coming together. What was His words? As oft as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Do this and remember me. You say, well, preacher, I remembered him before. We just did this a couple of months ago, or we just did this six months ago. I'm still remembering what we did six months ago. It's not the act that you ought to be remembering. It's the person that you ought to be remembering. It's that Jesus Christ, God's Son, put on flesh, came to this planet to die for man's sins, and the love that he displayed towards you, the life that he gave, ought to be something that you never get tired of rehearsing in your mind over and over again. He's describing what it takes to grow up and to grow up mature in the Lord fast. Abide in the doctrine. Abide in the fellowship. Abide in appreciation of the Lord's death. And number four, abide in prayers. In order for a Christian to grow up, he's going to have to practice 
praying. What does that mean? He's going to have to, with purpose, talk to God. With purpose. I'm not just talking about, Lord, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord must. I'm not talking, Lord, just bless this food. I'm talking about talking to God about things that are important. Things that you need the mind of God for. Things that you need the help of God with. One of the best illustrations in the Bible is old Jacob. Jacob had been a trickster all of his life. He was headed back home. He heard Edom was coming with several hundred men. And for the first time in his life that I can tell, he realized, I can't trick my way out of this. And the Bible says he wrestled with God all night. Literally, he wrestled with God. Friend, that's praying with purpose. That is, God, I need you. God, I can't live without you. God, I must have you. Now, Christian, you can be saved, not have these four things in your life, but you can't go from being an infant Christian to being a mature Christian unless these four things are part of your life. What's required inside the church to make the church have a better class of Christians? Infant Christians must minister to themselves. Number two, infant Christians must get a burden. Infant Christians must get a burden. Now, the word burden is a spiritual word that scares a lot of people. What, what in the world is a burden? What does that mean, I need to have a burden? Well, a burden is actually a spiritual emotion. And the closest English word that I know of to describe what kind of a spiritual emotion that is would be the word compassion. You need to have spiritual compassion. Now, in the Baptist churches for the last, as far as I know, last 40 or 50 years, we preachers in the Baptist churches have preached a lot along the lines that you don't need to build your life on emotions. That instead, you need to build your life on the Word of God. It's not how you feel that determines what you believe. It's what the Word of God says. And that's all true as far as it goes. But that's not the whole truth. Yes, you do need to build your God, your, your life, not on what you feel, but on what the Word of God says. However, emotions are important too. Spiritual emotions are important. For example, did you know Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, was moved to action by His emotions? Listen to what the Bible says concerning Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. But when He saw the multitudes, He was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Did you get what it says? When he saw the multitudes, he was moved. That means he began to do something. Compassion moved Jesus Christ to action. You say, well, preacher, that's just a fluke. <laughs> no, not really. Listen, Matthew 14, 14. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them. And he healed their sick. Again, Matthew, staying in the same gospel so that you'll understand it didn't just happen once and the same instant was repeated in different gospels. Four different times, Matthew says. Matthew 15, 32. Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on this multitude. Matthew 20, 34. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes and immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. What's the Bible teaching us? Jesus, God's son, had spiritual emotions. Jesus, God's son, did actions because his heart was moved with a burden. His heart felt compassion for people. Do you realize you and I can't be led of God? You and I can't grow into mature Christians unless we can feel what God wants us to feel. Three different writers in the New Testament, three different writers commanded the believer to feel compassion. Peter did in the book of 1 Peter, chapter 3, verse number 8. Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. 
John did, 1 John 3, 17. But whosoever hath this world's goods and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Jude wrote the same thing. And of some have compassion. Making a difference. Are you, are you getting a the theme? The theme is you're a believer. You're a Christian. You need to feel compassion for others. When was the last time you were moved by the spiritual compassion you felt for someone? When was the last time a missionary came and he showed slides of a city or of a nation of people that were lost that had no witness of Jesus Christ and a tear swelled up in your eye and dripped down your cheek because you felt compassion for those people. When was the last time you drove by a street corner and you saw a great crowd of people and it dawned on you those people are just like you were. They're lost. Nobody's ever told them about Jesus. And, and yeah, they got the same problems that you've got. They've got mothers that don't understand and they've got bills they can't pay and they've got kids that are always needy. They've got situations at work. They need the Jesus you needed to help you get through life. When was the last time you heard a prayer request and your heart just got so heavy for somebody else's brother or somebody else's sister or somebody else's friend or somebody else's lost loved one so heavy that you had to bow your knees before God and say, God, would you please, would you please help this person? When was the last time God was able to move you to do anything because you felt compassion? I know what it is to live in the 21st century beggars at almost every intersection telemarketers calling and wanting your money commercials about everything from dogs to human beings needing you to send financial aid I know what it is to be inundated with everybody else's needs so that the temptation just comes. Let's just write it off. Let's just, let's just understand there's a lot of flim flam folks out there. And, and they could go get a job if they want to. And, and they probably brought it on the side. But you know the bottom line is it really don't matter. What matters is there's people out there that need Jesus Christ. There's people out there that need compassion. That need somebody to love them. And you'll never become a mature Christian believer if you don't let God lead you and guide you with a burden. He's describing in the Scriptures the importance. The Bible actually warns us against being cold-hearted. Book of Revelation chapter 2, verse number 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Revelation three fifteen. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. That's Jesus talking. Jesus is saying, I'd rather you be either cold or hot, but this status where you're just lukewarm, where nothing really seems to hurt you or touch you one way or the other, he says, that just makes me want to spew you out of my mouth, literally vomit you. It makes me sick that you're that way. He says, I'd rather you be ice cold as to be lukewarm. Matthew 24, 12, Jesus talked about the end days. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. He was talking to his disciples, which means it was a message to the church. He says, because of the iniquity, the abundance of sin around us, the hearts of many, not just out there, but in here, will become cold and hard-hearted and indifferent. Do you realize God's not just interested in your actions. God's also interested in your reactions. How you react when you see certain things. 
God's interested. The book of 1 Kings chapter 21, Elijah had come to Ahab. Ahab was the most wicked king that had lived up into that day. He was as evil as evil could possibly be. And, and Elijah had come and preached a message to him. Basically, what Elijah preached was always the same. God's going to get you, big boy. Pretty much every time Elijah had a message to Ahab, it was God's going to get you. And so he came and he preached a message very specific. He says, God's going to deal with you. Listen to what the Bible says, beginning in verse number 27. And it came to pass, when Ahab heard those words, that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his Sundays will I bring the evil upon himself. Did you get what just happened? The word of God came to this evil-hearted man. And for some reason, his heart was broke. For some reason, probably the only time in his life, he actually was grieved over his sins. He ripped off his clothes. He put sackcloth on. He put ashes upon his head. And the Bible says he began to walk very carefully, very softly, very delicate, making sure he didn't offend God any more than he'd already offended God. Notice what God said concerning him. He said, because of that reaction, because he's listened to what I said, I'm not going to bring the judgment in his lifetime. I'll bring the judgment instead in his son's lifetime. What's he saying? God's not just watching what you do. God's watching how you react. It's very easy to get a cold heart, a calloused heart. You go out and you knock on a door. You can knock on 30 doors in an hour. Have them slammed in your face. Have curtains move on the other side. Nobody even come to the door. Not talk to a single soul. It's very easy to get the attitude. They don't care. They don't want it. I'm not going to take it to them. It's very easy to work beside someone for 20, 25 years. For them to have seen your life. For them to have heard your witness and for them to have ignored you, shut you down, and just written you off time after time. It's so easy for us just to get to the place where we don't care. We're at a new year. It's time to make some new commitments to Christ. Not New Year's resolutions, new commitments to Jesus Christ. Some of you have never read through the Bible, not once your whole life. It's very easy to say, it's a big book. 66 different, and there ain't no pictures. I mean, it's a big book. I remember the first time I was told, you've got to read through this whole book. It was a New Testament class. Lord, that's a big book. I've never read a book that big before. It's very easy to get a cold heart. Oh, that's what the preacher says. That's what those religious zealots down at the church says. But I'm telling you, God's looking at your heart. And God's wanting you to get a burden. It's a burden. Spiritual compassion. The emotion of compassion for spiritual things that helps infant Christians to grow, to become mature Christians. What does it take to get a better class of Christians? Well, infant Christians must minister to themselves. Number two, infant Christians must get a burden. Number three, infant Christians must enter the ministry. Infant Christians must enter the ministry. Now, here's another word that scares Christians. That word burden, that, that one kind of scares folks. Ministry scares them even more. Do you know what ministry is? Let me define it for you. Ministry is helping people spiritually. That's all it is. Anytime when a preacher or a missionary or a Sunday school teacher or the Word of God says ministry, it just means to help people Spiritually. And by the way, if, if even that phrase bends you out of shape, take heart. Because the Bible teaches us before you can minister to them spiritually, you may have to minister to them physically. You may have to put some clothes on their back, some food in their belly. You may have to put a roof over their head. So it's really just helping people. That's what ministry is. Can you not imagine that God wants every single believer to help 
people. Isn't that just God's nature? How could we in any way think of God as not wanting us to help other people? Friend, God wants you to help other people. Take your Bible, go over the book of Acts chapter 17. You won't need the text where you are. Go over to Acts chapter 17. Notice what took place in a very mature Christian's life. It's the Apostle Paul. Acts chapter 17, verse number 6, Paul's on his second missionary journey. He's been booted out of a city, no surprise there. And in verse number 16, he has a plan. His plan is he's going to go to Athens. Look what it says, verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Now, he just got booted out of the last city. So he left. He left his troop in that last city. The anger was projected towards him, so he needed to get out so that the work of God could go on. He decides, I'll just move on down the road a little bit. I'll go to Athens, and while I'm at Athens, I'll just wait for the troop to catch up. So he's going to Athens, not primarily with the thought of preaching. He's gone to Athens primarily with the thought of waiting. I'm going to go there and I'm going to wait for Timothy and Titus and the rest of the gang. So he goes and he just waits. That's his thought. But look what happens there in verse number 16. He sees what's going on in the city. And there's a word that's used. It says, his spirit was stirred. His spirit was was stirred. That word stirred implies two things. It implies he was emotionally burdened for those people. He saw the condition of that city and his emotional compassion began to revel up. It began to stir up. It began to come into play. His compassion. He saw them. He says, I see their condition and his compassion began to build up. But the word stir means more than that. It means he was moved emotionally, but it also means he was moved to action. To stir something is to push. It's to sling it around. When you stir a pot, you don't just sit there and feel sorry for the pot. You don't feel compassion for the pot. You begin to put the spoon in the pot and you begin to move things around. He was going to wait at Athens. But when he began to see what was going on, he felt emotion. And he was moved by that emotion to action. Look what happens in the next verse. Verse number 17. First word, powerful word, therefore. That means verse 17 is connected to verse 16. What happened to him in verse 16 is what prompted what he did in verse 17. What did he do in verse 17? He began to dispute in the synagogues with the Jews and with the devout persons, and the market daily with them that met with him. Why did Paul preach? Was that his reason to go to Athens? No, not according to the Word of God. The reason he went was to wait. Maybe he was tired. Maybe he was bruised. Maybe he was thinking, I just need to rest. I need to, I need to cycle down for a while. I'm going to go there, I'm going to wait. Maybe it'll be a few days, maybe it'll be a week or two, but I'm just going to go and I'm going to go wait. However, God put a burden on him. His spirit got stirred. Not just he felt compassion. Thank God when Jesus feels compassion, he doesn't just have feelings. He has actions that go with those feelings. And Paul, mimicking Jesus, was stirred. And so he changed his mind. I ain't just going to wait. No, sir, I'm going to preach. And the Bible says he began in the synagogues disputing. That means debating, preaching to those Jewish leaders. And I know Paul, before long, it spilled over inside the streets and out into the Gentile community, what happened? His heart got stirred. And before he realized it, he was in the ministry. He hadn't planned on being in the ministry, not at Athens. He planned on waiting. But when his heart got stirred, before he knew it, he was back in the ministry. Ministry. You know what it takes to get into the ministry? What it takes to help other Christians, it takes a burden. A burden that stirs us. A burden that moves us. 
I was going back and looking through the scriptures and noticing some things that God commanded concerning the heart. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 15, Old Testament, I know. But in the Old Testament, God was saying to the people of Israel, he says, when you walk through your gates and you see the poor on either side, do not harden your hearts and do not close your hands. He says, you see those people on either side of that gate and they're poor, they don't have jobs, they're disabled, they're hungry. He says, don't you let your heart get hard, don't you let your your hands close. He said, "You, you open your heart, you keep your heart open, and then you open your hands and you lend to those people whatever they have need of. You know what he was saying? If you walk through the gates with your eyes closed, you won't ever see the needs of the people. But if you walk through the gates with your eyes open, You'll see their needs and you'll open their hands. You know what we need? We need a burden that opens our eyes and that opens our hands. I know, I know everybody's got so much to do already. I do believe that's the biggest ploy the devil's got. He's made us so busy in this day and age, we just don't have time for it. And you know what's strange? Is everything we're busy doing is working on the things that was supposed to save us time to begin with. I mean, we got a car. Why did we get that car? Well, it's supposed to save us some time. Instead of us having to walk to the store, instead of us having to walk to work, now we get in the car, we drive there. Isn't it amazing? You get up about 7 o'clock and you drive somewhere, you'll see ladies putting their makeup on while they're driving down the highway. They had not even got enough time to put their makeup on before they get in the car. So they're going down the road and they're putting their makeup on while they drive. Hey, what happened to the time we were supposed to have? We spend it all taking care of the car that's supposed to save us. Same thing with the washing machine. Same thing with the dryer. Same thing with the computer. Same thing with the cell phone. Everything the devil said, it'll save you time. It'll make life easier. Man, it hadn't made life no easier and it sure hadn't saved us any time. We've got so much to do that it's real easy for us to close our eyes and close our hands. And as long as we live with closed eyes and fisted hands, we'll never see the needs of others. We'll never have that burden. Over the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 7, Paul was talking about every person having spiritual gifts. Every person's got spiritual gifts. You know what? A burden will help you find your spiritual gift and grow it. A lot of people have told me over the years, preacher, I don't know what my gifts are. I preach quite often. You've got a spirit. There's a reason why God's got you here. There's something you're... I don't know what God's got me here. I've asked Him. I don't know. Have you ever figured out you can't use spiritual gifts on yourself? The only way a spiritual gift works is to use it on somebody else. I'm not the best, but one of the gifts God's given me is is the ability to preach. It don't do me any good to preach to myself. For me to to use my gift, i got to find somebody to preach to. I kind of think God's called me with some ability to lead. I can't lead myself. In order for me to use that gift, there's got to be a, a effort on my part to minister that gift on others. And by the way, every spiritual gift there is, not a one of them did God ever give so that you could use it on yourself. If you want to know what your spiritual gifts are, you're going to have to get a burden for somebody else. You're going to have to open your eyes to the needs. And by the way, it's when you see that other people need your help. That's when you get worried about building that gift up. I didn't care whether I preached or not until I needed to preach. Now that I need to preach, I'd kind of like to do it better. And so I study and I pray and I try to hone whatever gifts God's given me. Why? I make an effort to improve what I can do for Jesus because there's ministry that I want to be effective at. It all ties in together, friend. But it starts, infant Christians have to minister to themselves. Infant Christians have to get a burden. And infant Christians have to get in the ministry. By the way, it's that burden that won't let you quit. There's not a person in the ministry of any capacity who hasn't wanted to just throw his hands up in the air and say, I quit. I've told you before, I quit. I quit all the time. I just never quit long enough for you to find out about it. But I quit all the time. Sometimes five or six times in a day, I quit. 
But there's a reason why I'm still at Green Pond Baptist Church. There's a reason why I'm still preaching. And the reason why is there's a burden. I want to do what God wants me to do. I want to see lost folks get saved. I want to see saved folks grow up. I want to see God do something in the lives of the members of the Green Pond Baptist Church like he's never done before. I've been praying for God to touch this church for 30 years. My soul, if I leave now, I'll have to come back to visit when God shows up. I want to see God do something. It takes a burden. What will it take? To make you a better Christian. It's going to take at least three things. You're going to have to make a priority of growing yourself up in Jesus Christ. You don't just grow. You don't just grow. I used to make the statement, my kids just grew. You know, I, I was trying to stop them. Now, I, I can remember telling some folks I used to tie books to the top of their head, try to keep them from growing up. But the truth of the matter is, I was working against myself because I just kept feeding them. I kept watering them. I mean, all, all that. If I'd really wanted them to stop growing, I could have stopped them from growing. It would have killed them, but I could have. The truth of the matter is, it takes work to make people grow. And you're the one that's going to have to determine you're going to grow yourself up in Jesus Christ. How's it been so far? How many years have you been claiming to know Jesus? Five, 10, 20, 30? You say, well, preacher, I sure am an immature Christian. Well, when are you going to get tired of that and grow yourself up? It's necessary for you to minister to yourself. Number two, you got to get a burden. Some of you are burdened about some things, and I understand politics has got a lot of folks stirred right now. You're burdened. Some, some folks are stirred about their jobs. Some folks are stirred about the economy. I get all those things. But my friend, one of these days, if you're going to grow up in Jesus, you're going to have to get concerned, compassionate about men and women and their eternal destinies. Some of you have mothers and fathers that are going to go to hell. Some of you have sons and daughters that are going to go to hell. Some of you have best friends and co-workers that are going to go to hell. And you're the one God's put in their life. If you don't get a burden for their soul, if you don't get a burden for and I mean if you don't get a burden for their soul greater than what they've got, because I meet people all the time, I'm far more burdened for their eternal soul than they are. If you don't get a burden for their soul, they're going to die and split hell wide open. You need to get a burden. And then number three, you need to get busy helping somebody besides just your own. Now maybe your own need help. Maybe they need spiritual help. Maybe they need financial help. Maybe they need emotional help. I'm not saying cast them away. I'm just saying you're going to have to get more burdened about other people outside your immediate circle. Because friend, we're vastly outnumbered in this day and age. There's lost folks. There's folks in misery all around us. And they're just looking for somebody that'll say, I care. And I'll do what I can for you. Many of you are here at the Green Pond Baptist Church because somebody impressed upon you that they cared. Maybe it was me. Probably wasn't. There might have been another member inside the church. But somebody impressed upon you that they cared. And the way to get people into the Green Pond Baptist Church is for you to go out there and impress upon them that you care. It's a new year. What do we need? We need a fresh burden. Let's pray together. Father.